This podcast is brought to you by RX Smart Gear. Whether you're just starting out in your fitness journey or an avid workout enthusiast, a jump rope is one of the most essential pieces of equipment you should have in your workout arsenal, and I cannot recommend RX Smart Gear jump ropes highly enough. I've been using the RX Smart Gear jump rope for close to 10 years now. The quality, variety, customization are beyond compare. I actually did a workout yesterday with my first RX Smart Gear rope that I got almost 10 years ago, and it's still an amazing addition, still worked out great for the workout that I did. I love these ropes. Not only are they dedicated to constantly improving and challenging the community with their variety of ropes, but they're also des- dedicated to the education when it comes to their ropes and promote proper movement and technique patterns, which we of course love at Power Monkey Fitness. They've recently launched their new Freevo rope, which is made of a high impact polymer that can withstand up to a 50 pound dumbbell impact. With grippy handles and smooth transitions between drills, you cannot lose with this rope. Take your freestyle game to another level and visit rxsmartgear.com and order your rope today. Welcome to the Power Monkey Podcast, where we chat with the best in the world about what they do. I'm your host, Dave Durante, and this week my co-host is Jordan Samuel. And we have two guests on for this episode, both from Deep End Fitness and the Underwater Torpedo League. Prime Hall and Don Tran are the co-founders. They are both former Special Operations Marine Raiders and went on to be water survival instructors for many years. Their program is very, very interesting, using a pool, using breathing techniques, using underwater to become more capable and more fit. A lot of the things that they utilize in the military are being expressed and brought to the everyday athlete. Very cool from a deep end fitness side to be able to see how they implement in water and out of water training. And even cooler than that is they created a sport around it. The Underwater Torpedo League has now six teams around the West Coast, branching out into more cities around the country. We talk a little bit about how this sport was developed, where it was initiated from, what they hope to do with the sport, and a little bit of ins and outs in terms of how the game is played. Hope you guys enjoy this one, and we are very much hoping to get down to Southern California and jump in the pool with these guys sometime soon. Enjoy. Well, Don and Prime, thank you both for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, how you guys doing? Doing well. Thank you for having us on the show. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, well, we we uh, we appreciate the time, and uh, you know, it's something that uh, Jordan uh, kind of let me let me in on what you guys have been working on and how cool these projects you have going on. Before we get into Deep End Fitness mm-hmm. and what you got going on with the Underwater Torpedo League and things like that, I want to give the listeners a little bit of a background because I'm not sure how how much our listeners in the CrossFit setting, functional fitness world, know who you guys are and kind of your backgrounds uh, from the military and some of those things with regards to you guys being Marines. But would you guys give us a little bit of a rundown on how you guys met in the past and some of your experience in terms of um, while you guys were Marines? Yeah, of course. Prime, you want to take this time? Yeah, so uh, Don and I met uh, at special operations training um back uh, almost 15 years ago and uh from from there we uh we trained together for for close to a year as we prepared to go into marine special operations which is uh known today as marine raiders um <clears throat> which was still in development at that time and so uh we used a lot of our uh we we had an opportunity to be water survival instructors and run a pool for about a year as we were waiting to go into special operations training. And during that time, we got a lot of reps in um, with uh, underwater training um, and training ourselves and training others with water confidence and seeing kind of how you can unlock different results and, and move your baseline or push your edge, you know, both mentally and physically in different areas. And so, um, you know, from there we went into uh, we went to North Carolina and went through all of our training together um, for about a year, and then we both got stationed back here at First Raider Battalion, um, and then we, uh, you know, we're in operational uh, for about eight years uh, myself, and then I ended up getting uh, wounded in Afghanistan. I got blown up uh, in in some in some uh, 
insider attacks. And this is about, this is 10 years ago. Uh, this week actually um, was when that happened. I ended up getting medically separated. Um, and so uh, Don had, was uh, at that same time getting separating out of the military as well. And so we had both kind of been on different tracks from when we first went into training and when we were running the pool together to, uh, you know, when we got to our unit, we were both in different units within that larger unit and we barely saw each other. So we we're both getting out and we started putting our heads together on work, things that we could potentially partner on. And uh, it started leading into, you know, the performance training and what was missing for us when we were going through our special operations training and what would be, you know, the best system or approach that we could use, you know, as simple as possible to, you know, train individuals and unlock results for all skill levels from, you know, beginners to professional athletes and Olympians and all that. So um, we came, our, uh, we developed the system of free um, and I'll, I'll let, I'll go ahead and let Don take it from there. Actually, before you get into free, I'm just curious about, you guys mentioned being water survival instructors. I mean, to be at that level, to be able to instruct comfort in such a uncomfortable situation, did you guys grow up being comfortable in the water yourselves? Or was that something you had to learn? Or was the military kind of where you became comfortable in those types of settings? For me personally, I grew up swimming like in neighborhood pools and I grew up on the coast of Texas on like South Padre Island and North Padre Island where I was at the beach a lot and I was in the ocean and I was doing like, like I said, the neighborhood pools, but I never was on a swim team or any technical style swimming until I went to the water survival and uh, instructor course. And then, you know, really once I became an instructor, I really wasn't a, a decent instructor until I got plenty of reps instructing people. And then that's when I started to figure out like how to actually, you know, become effective and, and support others, you know, to, to break through barriers. What yeah. about you, Dom? A similar background, uh, just did some swimming lessons when I was little, bodyboarding, uh, growing up by the beach in, in Long Beach and Huntington Beach, but that's pretty much it. Uh, I mean, it seems like that, that's the kind of thing that takes years and years to become not just confident in the water, but uh, as we're going to go into this, what you guys do in the water is intense. It's not like for faint of heart. It seems like you have to be at a level in terms of proficiency um, that the military basically taught you guys that. Huh? So it is something you can learn later in life. It's not something you have to kind of grow up with to be able to feel that comfortable at that level in the water. Would you say that's true? Yeah, that's correct. So, I mean, in the military, the, um, especially in the water survival course or special operations training, it's a lot of sink or swim situation where you can kind of push through it uh, and make it or you fail and you quit or, you know, um, so it's either you make it or you, or you don't. So we were lucky enough to be able to have that experience as water survival instructors and working at the pool before going into special operations. So that really helped them kind of develop our water confidence, uh, not just for ourselves, but in instructing and teaching other people. Mm -hmm. I have a question about that. So it's pretty clear that in the context of the military, um, that having uh, confidence in the water and those skills that you guys were were taught and then were then teaching is of a ton of value. What made you guys decide that this was going to be something that was of value to the civilian or the athletic world? And 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 what were those those points that you felt they were missing that you guys were going to be able to provide through your you know teachings? Yeah, so for for us, we're both we've both been into different training and kind of um, deep into different training mo modalities and stuff for the last you know decade to you know twenty years, and so uh, getting into training, it's like what, what's the how what's going to be the most wh which training can we do that's going to have the most impact on the individual, right? And so if I'm going to take both of you and take you to the gym or wherever, I'm take you to the ocean or whatever it is, I mean, the, the biggest impact I feel like I can have is if I take you and we go to the pool and we go underwater, because then you're immediately going to go into a survival situation in your mind. And then that's an immediate opportunity to, to exercise mental focus. 
So pretty much that point that you get to at the end of your workout where you feel like you're in the zone and all those other tab mental tabs are closed out and you're completely focused on whatever it is that you're doing, you know, at, at 50 minutes or an hour or however long it takes someone to get into that zone, right? Mentally with everything that, that we have going on with the water, it's like a cheat code to where you can do it like within 30 seconds, you're locked into that because you're, you're focusing beyond that alarm that's going off that's telling you that you need air. So basically, you're saying that it's a way to get super present in the moment. And <laughs> that when you can get there reliably, then, you know, that's going to start benefiting you. Yeah, exactly. Yes. A lot of people think about our program as like, oh, you know, everybody should be water confident or everybody should be comfortable with the water. But we really use the water as a, as a medium, as a, a change of environment for our athletes and the people that we train, right? Because like Brian was saying, when we go underwater and you're doing a, a underwater swim or for a certain distance, there's always going to be that alarm that comes up like, hey, at some point you're going to reach that fire or flight symptom where whether you come up for air or you stay down, knowing your capabilities and your limitations. And dealing with that kind of stressors and that anxiety and facing that multiple times when we're training in the pool and choosing to stay in the fight. We believe that that has a lot of effects when you go on land as well. And it better situates you to help you deal with stress and, and anger when you're, you know, engaging in a argument or a heated debate at work or with your significant other, or if you need to run into a burning building, or if you're a policeman or in the military, you need to run into the, um, a house that ha there's gunfire going on. So that's where we kind of developed the system too. And, and so is there a, a technique that you guys then use to help people kind of not enter that fight or flight mode or like remain present when they're underwater and that, that desire to panic comes up? I mean, how, how is it that you guys, or is it just yeah. experience and reps as you get more and more comfortable with it? It's both. So the starting, yeah, it's both. But the starting point for all of this is water survival. So uh, military water survival started, the program started after World War II when people act that were on ships, they accidentally fell off the ship and ended up in a survival situation in the ocean. So imagine like a, a sailor, male or female that's sweeping or whatever on the side that really is, is a good swimmer or is, has no swimming experience, falls off and then the ship keeps going and then they're, they're out there for, you know, almost a week or whatever till they get rescued and the ones that survived they debriefed them and they created the military water survival program mm -hmm. so basically what it is is imagine like all of a sudden you hit a huge stressor in life or you're in the middle of the ocean and you fell off the ship and you're not getting water and food and you don't know how long you're going to be there what are you going to do right you're going to get relaxed as possible so that you could sustain for as long as you can and manage your energy expenditure. So basically the individuals that survived, they turned themselves into a flotation device, right? They figured it out without any learning. They just figured it out because that's what they had to do to survive. And so they learned how to hold their air in and make themselves float. They learned how to turn their, their uh, shirt blouses and their pants into flotation devices and all that other stuff. So basically that's the starting point of it is that once we hit stress that we, that we, we gain that uh, that process of relax, and then work through the process. Work through the the the, the process of it, right? So, um, and eliminating part, drag the whole way. Yeah, and the second part of that is the prep work before we go underwater or before you go into that stressful situation, right? And for us, it's breath work, right? Because we know that breath work is pretty much the tap and the remote control that goes into form our parasympathetic to our sympathetic nervous system. And that's going to prepare us to better engage into whatever stressful environment that we're about to go into. So the key is the breath work before we go down underwater. It, it sounds like we're touching a little bit on all of the free components here. So may, maybe we can just jump into that since we're already talking about cognitive motion and being able to actually treat yourself like a buoy out there. The ideas around efficient breathing. Can you actually dive a little deeper into this idea of free and how you guys incorporate into the training? Yeah, of course. Um, I'll hit the first two points. So um, focus, we're, we're, focus, we're emphasizing mental focus. So uh, how many tabs can we close out just like a computer to where we could be singularly focused on one thing, 
whatever the present thing is. And we're breaking each thing down into small, digestible, easy steps. So if we're going to go underwater and we're going to do a 25 meter swim, or we're going to do a 50 meter underwater walk, or we're going to do something like that, we're going to break it down into these systematic things to where it's like a video game and we're just doing one step at a time. And then it makes it very simple. Um, so that's mental focus, relaxation, on-demand relaxation. So for, for being, when, we, when we're operating underwater, we really have to exercise on-demand relaxation because we're not getting new oxygen. You know, we're not, we don't have a, a, a dive tank down there. You know what I'm saying? So whatever air that we go down with, we're managing our, our energy off of what we have. And so um, we want to be completely relaxed and then manage our energy and our, our, all of our movement and ensure that everything has a, an ROI. So for example, when we go underwater and we do breath holds, you know, um, we always start um, with, the, with the basic, you know, short breath hold. But what we're looking for when, when we're doing breath holds underwater is for individuals to go underwater and just be completely relaxed. And if their body naturally sinks and they want to go to the bottom and sink and, and relax and do it. But what we, what we don't want to see is individuals that are just using all this energy to stay underwater the whole time to hold their breath. Cause we want everyone to be completely relaxed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, for economy of motion is pretty much it's for the, for us, it's in the water is pretty black or white, right? Any extra inefficient movement is going to create additional drag. So it's always about minimizing that drag. And we really came up with the principles of economy of motion for martial arts from um, the, our time in the military of like, how fast can you draw your pistol as you're just drawing it out, right? How do you eliminate all that movements to minimize the milliseconds that it's extra gonna take, or it's gonna take extra time for you to pull that trigger on the enemy. Um, and the last one's efficient breathing, which we talked about already, taking efficient breaths, activating your diaphragm the full time, uh, breathing through your nose when you can for the most times, the gears of breath that we learned from Brian McKenzie, um, we apply all those and the, we take a lot of breath work from Wim Hof as well, so. It's super interesting. Actually, a lot of the same points here, you know, um, I teach a lot of handstand work. We teach a lot of stuff in the gymnastics world. And one of the things that we teach with handstands are long duration handstands, right? Being able to hold handstands for 20 minutes, half an hour, um, the, the type of things that most people learning inversions are not quite used to. And a lot of the, the principles that you're talking about here with free mimic the exact same things we talk about, like, you know, only stressing muscles that are necessary, necessary to be inverted. Uh, making sure that you have consistent breath so you don't pass out. A lot of these things are very, very similar to being inverted as well as being in water. It's similar. Jordan, would you say that? A hundred percent. And I was going to say that, like, when I read that on your website, the free operating system, the first thing I thought about was my journey in jujitsu. I mean, the, the, the most notable thing that I've learned in jujitsu is to relax, stay calm, don't panic there's a way out and start problem solving your way there and be efficient with how you're getting there. And um, so to me, it seems like this operating system that you guys have translates outside of the pool into as many aspects of life as I can think of right now. And so I'm curious to know from your perspective, for the people that have come through your course, have they expressed that same thing after they've left the course? And they're like, oh my God, this helped in these other areas too. And I mean, is that the way that you guys envisioned all this happening? Yeah. So when, uh, before the pandemic, we had uh, several of our sponsored athletes were top MMA fighters, uh, male and female, and we were working with them. Um, and obviously they were training, doing, you know, pretty much once to twice a week in the pool with us, and then started to uh, bring us in on their end of their fight camps for eight to 12 weeks right before their fight to basically help them set with goal setting and then, you know, uh, meeting their goals and, and creating strategies and processes to meet their goals. And so we started with that, you know, probably two years, probably 2000, end of 2018, beginning of 2019, and just did that consistently, you know, as kind of a, a um, uh, pilot course, right, or, or a program that we ran that was different from all the other pool stuff that we were doing. Um, and then that was extremely successful from the benefits of it. I mean, one of the one of the examples of that is a girl named Liz Carmouche, and she uh, was a Marine as well. And uh, when we met her, she was about to stop fighting. She was an MMA fighter, and uh, she was about to stop fighting. And um, 
looking to go back into the military. And right now she's the Bellator flyweight world champion, you know, so like the, the mindset stuff. And like, I have so many different and crazy examples of stuff like that. Like this last Saturday we watched, if, if you guys watched the UFC fights last weekend, the ultimate fighter uh, championship, the girl Juliana Miller that won out of the females, She's also one of our instructors and has been training with us for several years. She only has four MMA fights and she won the whole thing. And so, um, you know, uh, Joe Musgrove is one of the starting pitchers for the Padres. And like, he's, he's trained with trains with us all off season, like once to twice a week. And, you know, went from uh, being able to hold his breath for a minute to over a four minute breath hold you know, and just like completely having the best season of his life right now. He just signed a hundred million dollar five-year contract with the Padres, you know, like all the executives that we're working with or, you know, and so a lot of it uh, is qualitative, you know, like we're seeing a lot of breakthroughs. We get a lot of positive feedback. We have people that are transforming their life and their relationships and, you know, transforming their performance personally and professionally but um we qualitatively have a research study that we've been running for the last year out of asu that we're going to be publishing uh in the next 30 days and so that right there was um the uh the premise behind it is to assess the benefits of deep in fitness and underwater training because there's a lot of gaps in the science world, science world around what the benefits of training are and then along with uh, education gaps so um, one of our missions is to uh, basically educate the world on the benefits of, of what what we do um, and why it's important and so uh, I think Don can elaborate a little bit more on any of that yeah, and uh, the base of the study is to really focus on um, currently the mental aspect of what happens in your mind. So uh, some of the key things and results we found is a, a significant decrease in depression, anxiety, positive uh, increase in positive affluent and community aspects. So um, yeah, we're excited to roll that out coming soon. That's now, huge. Yeah, so I mean, it's called, your, your program is called Deep End Fitness, and there is definitely no shallow pool components to this. And you guys make this available to basically all non-swimmers. A couple of questions about it. One, if someone is not a swimmer and someone is not comfortable with water, you still throw them right in right away, right? It's, it's a sink or swim kind of situation where you guys are there to assist. No. Not. Okay. It's, 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 it's the opposite of sink or swim. So okay. for us, we're giving, we're always focused on that foundational building block approach. And we're wanting to stay in that crawl phase as long as possible until that individual is completely confident and there's a two-way trust build. And then we move on to the next block. But uh, we always start each and in, each individuals that trains with us starts with the screener. And then sometimes we're doing a modified screener, you know, each week, you know, but each person starts with a screener and once they're, and, and if they can't meet the criteria that needed to, to, to meet the screener, we train them to standard and, and the whole program was built for non-swimmers. So, uh, we've, we've trained so many countless individuals to swim for the first time, but, um, you know, it's like the principles of what we just talked through of water survival is a little bit the same of someone that's like learning to swim, like, or just be relaxed and float in the water and be able to manage themselves and be efficient. And then from there, they can start to work, you know, um, and also understanding how to work with their buoyancy. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, can you go over a little bit of what that screener might look like if it's somebody completely new to the program? Yeah, so uh, there's four, four things that they need to accomplish. One is a 10 minute water tread. The next one is a 25 meter underwater swim. The third thing is a 25 meter, 10 pound brick toe. So they'll carry a 10 pound rubber weight and keep it out of the water for the 25 meters. And the last one is um, a mass retrieval. So we'll take off their goggles or their mask. We'll throw them down in the deep end of the pool. They'll control their buoyancy uh, level and keep their hands behind their back and pick up the goggles with their mouth, right? Mm. So all of them kind of solidifies a few specific things for us. So the treading the waters, hey, make sure they can survive on their own. 
the underwater swim or the underwater crossover is pretty much everything that we teach in the free principle. How do you stay focused? How do you stay relaxed? How do you have efficient movement underwater? And then before you go down, how do you take those efficient breaths, calm yourself down and making sure that you fill up your lungs all the way. Hmm. And then the last, the brick toe is to make sure that we can add some additional resistance on you and you can still survive on your own. And then the mass retrieval is just to put you in an uncomfortable situation, taking your hands away, taking your breath, a little bit of your breath away, and then taking your eyesight away. Um, but we have every single one of our classes runs a screener in the beginning. So if you don't pass the screener the first time you come back and you keep working until you pass it, but that's kind of the minimum. And we have a different approach instead of, Hey, let's jump in the pool and swim laps and let's do freestyle and breaststroke. We kind of teach them how to survive in the water, be confident in the water before they're actually going and doing the workout. Jordan, how do you think you would do on the screener? Uh, I think I would struggle with, well, first of all, how long is the pool again? 25 meters. Is that what you said? Yeah, 25 meters, 25 yards, just depending on, on which pool. Yeah. I think the one I would struggle the most with is the uh, the picking up the goggles at the bottom just because um, I wear contacts. So I uh, would have to open my eyes and I'd lose my lenses and then I wouldn't be able to see anything. So I, I don't we know. Like the people with contacts keep their, keep their goggles on. So oh, yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's um, going to start getting contacts now just to go to the thing. Like, oh, I can keep my goggles on if I have contacts. Cool. But we, we didn't even say what's the depth of the pool is it consistently the same depth what is the depth of uh what you guys work with yeah so most of the ones we look for um are pools with diving boards so um in u.s code it's uh, anywhere between 12 to 15 feet okay all right that's good to know i, I do uh, have a question real quick about one of the aspects of the screener we, we have a, a coach on our staff uh her name is dawn fletcher she went and did one of your um one of your courses and she was talking to me about, you know, how amazing she thought it was. And one of the things she said was that people that in the beginning of the course who may not be able to swim that full length underwater, at the end of the course, you guys do something where you have a buddy and you pass a torpedo back and forth underwater. And every single one of those people, even the ones that couldn't swim the whole length on their own, were able to make it to the end. And so I'm curious what causes that? Is there some sort of psychological thing? Cause you feel like you're being held accountable to a partner and a buddy and there's responsibility. Like what's the psychology behind that? Yep. So that's exactly why we started uh, the underwater torpedo league. So when prime and I were working at the pool together, I was having an extremely hard time getting comfortable underwater. And uh, we started playing this game. We called it underwater football at the time uh, where we were passing around this toy torpedo. And then we were, grappling each other playing with it and, and back then we would put like kettlebells down at the deep end of our 15 feet pool and the goal was to hang on to the torpedo and then hang on to the kettlebell for three seconds while someone thrashes you right so um but when we noticed that when we go underwater and we put our focus on the torpedo or an object or something outside of our internal thoughts of like hey we're thinking like i'm stressed out i have no air and we think about something else and putting our focus on something else, the first one of free, mm -hmm. that changes our aspect, that changes our how it changes our heart rate, number one, right? Physically, changes our heart rate. So it slows it down. So we're not burning as much oxygen as we're under there. So that already helps us out. And then mentally, it puts our focus on and calms us down by putting focus instead of um, thinking about all the stressors that we have, especially for air. It's pretty cool, man. Like that in and of itself seems like a really powerful technique to get around and accomplish some uncomfortable stuff. I mean, being unable to breathe in a stressful physical situation is going to make, I would imagine, majority of people freak out. And if you can just the one little thing that can maybe not solve all the problems, but help a great deal, and that's going to build a ton of confidence right out of the gate. Yeah, for sure. So I, I was watching some videos on uh, some of the ways you guys train outside of the screener and outside of the course itself. It seems like you do a lot of like the fitness actual training is in pool and then out of water kind of back and forth type things where you're doing some ground work, uh, whether that's squats or some dumbbell work, things like that. And it kind of fits in line with a CrossFit type of a workout and type of workouts that maybe uh, an athlete that might have access to a pool would do in a CrossFit type setting. And it reminded me a lot of a workout that actually came up with the CrossFit games this past weekend. Did you guys watch any of the games? Are you familiar with CrossFit and kind of what goes on with the CrossFit games in and of themselves? I am familiar with CrossFit. I didn't watch the, the full one. Um, but uh, yeah, we do know there was some water movements. At what, yeah, yeah. They, they had, they had a pool event. It was the first time they ever had an indoor pool event and it was a, a 25 meter pool and they had to do a 50 meter swim and then get out and do a ski erg with increasing number of calories per round. And they do eight rounds of this. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't hit the calorie number within a two minute window, you were out and they kept increasing mm -hmm. uh, the calories per round. 
But reason why, one, it just reminded me of maybe something that you guys would incorporate into your training. But the other thing had to do with there was a particular athlete that was a professional swimmer on one of the teams. And that person was an outlier. You can just see that the comfort level that he had in the water versus everyone else that is considered an elite athlete within this space, it was noticeable. Right. And the thing that was most noticeable was that he was looking like he wasn't even trying in the water. Like every stroke was deliberate. It was efficient. It was easy. He didn't look like he was doing anything unnecessary. And he was coming out of the water and just crushing the skier because he had the energy to do so. So, I mean, that type of training, is that something that you, those type of workouts, is that something that you kind of incorporate a lot of in water and out of water and does efficiency in the water kind of translate then into being able to do more outside of the water? Yes, for all the above. Then we do both inside and out, right? So pretty much our four systems, uh, similar to the CrossFit modalities, um, we have, we train in movement and that's in and out of the water for us. Um, and then, so we focus on both, right? We do regular functional fitness movements outside of the pool and, and in the water. But of course, if you're having easier time in one, it's going to reflect in the other ones. You're going to have an easier time in others. So we're trying to find that balance right now within our own community and our own workouts on, on delivering that to us. Cause a lot of times we have athletes that come, they might be a professional surfer, but their squats look horrible. Mm -hmm. You know, but they might be amazing in the water of holding their breath, but their strokes might be like a surfer. Like they're on the paddle board or paddling the whole time. So it's kind of a unique kind of community where we have just a over our, just such a wide variety of different athletes coming to train. Uh, so we want to make sure that they move correctly out of the water as well. Um, especially and in the water. Can you, can you give us an example of like a benchmark or a workout that you love doing uh, maybe as an athlete yourself that incorporates in water and out of water uh, kind of exercises together? Yeah. So we're, we're just releasing some uh, of our own benchmark workouts right now. And the first one we just dropped today on uh, Instagram, we call it the alligator and one of our instructors um, named it for us. Um, so it's three rounds of what we call 10 gutter ups. So it's like a muscle up on the side of the pool. And then it's um, 25 meters sprint swim, swim until the other side of the pool, jump out, do 20 air squats, and then uh, catch your breath. And you're going to hit a 25 meter underwater swim. And if you don't make that underwater swim, then you owe 10 burpees on the other side. Um, three, three rounds of that? Three rounds. And the last one is five bobs. So controlling your buoyancy level with the amount of oxygen you have in your lungs. So you really need to catch your breath before you back go back down because you're releasing all your air to sink down to the bottom, kicking off the bottom, coming back up, grabbing a breath in three rounds. Okay, so the, the bob is all the way down to the bottom of the pool and then back up 15, yep. 15 feet. Correct. Right. But when you do, when you break the surface, you just have enough time to catch your breath before you go. You don't, you can't tread up there, right? It's just up and then right back down. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. It's just it? a breathing pattern, right? Letting go of all your air, taking a quick pause, kicking up back at the surface, pulling the air in, letting all that air go all the way down to the bottom, take a quick pause, kick back up, grab a breath of air. So it's just a breathing practice. I'm if curious. You that, you... No, go ahead. Sorry, I was just asking if you guys both have done the workout already and how, how it went. Yeah, I did mine in around like eight minutes and some change. And uh, the fastest one in the community was at six minutes. And he's a CrossFitter, one of our coaches as well. At this point in your careers, you guys have obviously been training so much underwater. Um, what what are your longest breath holds like at this point, each of you? Personally or from athletes? Uh, personally, I'm, I'm just curious. And then maybe uh, what, what's been one of the most stark improvements you've seen in some of your athletes from like somebody comes in and can hold their breath for 30 seconds and now they can hold it for, I don't know, two minutes. Yeah, I'm at I'm at just under four right now, and uh, I've broken four maybe two or three times. Yeah, I've broken four a couple times, and then typically uh, I need to be training on a regular basis on doing like the CO two tolerance tables um, that I that I do um, with the different apps that I use um, to do that. But three and a half minutes to and over four. Um, it's, it's pretty much like two weeks of training and then be good. But, um, you know, it also depends on like, you know, uh, if you're fasting for 12 hours, you might be able to hit a four minute, you know, hmm. just off of, you know, 
once of, off of having an empty stomach and then getting a nice warm up and then knocking it out, you know, but, uh, but the, the style of, of our breath holding just to, for anybody listening, the mechanics of it, you know, we're not doing any hyperventilation. And what we're doing is we're emptying out all of our, all of our quote unquote dirty air and dumping everything out completely empty. And then we're taking a full breath in. Um, and, you know, we, we I, I like to breathe in through the mouth, but obviously if you choose to use nasal, you can, but taking a full breath in and then holding that breath. And then that's how we initiate the breath hold. Um, and so uh, there's no hyperventilation and we're using our natural uh, abilities, you know, to hold our breath. You guys said that you do some Wim Hof style breathing in there too, with the the sort of protocols that you guys have. I'm curious to know, because I've done some of his stuff and I know that there's a big component where you are exhaling as strongly as you can and then holding that that breath yeah. with an ex- so, exhalation. So where's what's how does that play in? Is there value there? Yeah, so not, we don't do any any of that. Yeah. Wim Hof style stuff at the pool or around breath holding or anything like that but we what we do that's comparable or that people might say kind of looks like it is we do upper regulation breathing at the beginning which is what Don was talking about Brian McKenzie's gear gears of breath and that's gear four so we go in through the nose out through the mouth and we we get everyone jacked up really quick and we go do that for 25 seconds or so so we're just <laughs> And that's, that's an example of how we would warm up. And then they, we would immediately go into recovery breathing. And then that would just, that would be one rep of, of showing how we do it whenever we're going to jump in the pool and we come up from underwater and we're a little bit taxed from whatever drill we just did. We're going to go right into recovery and recover as quickly as possible and get reset for the next thing. Now, how long does it normally take? What, what are the recommendations in terms of, uh, taking someone who's completely new to um, breath holding and say they are at a short amount of time, being able to build to something where they actually, you know, are, are at a couple of minutes. Do you recommend doing this multiple times per week, every day? Is it starting out a couple of days a week and then building from there? What are the protocols that you normally recommend? First, I recommend just going out and doing it. So one time, you know, don't give yourself a huge barrier entry of entry to say, I want to get into this and get one session and then go from there. But, you know, recommend, it depends on what your goal is. If you're training for military or special operations, or if you're an athlete, then multiple times a week. But, um, you know, I've seen significant impact of individual doing it. Our, our research study was based off of individuals doing it once a week for four to six weeks. And we saw, as Don said, significant impact. Um, but I, I was out in uh, Key West a couple of weeks ago at the Army special forces dive school and we were doing a combat wounded uh um mindset event with all these uh wounded special operations veterans and so it was really cool we had we were doing coral restoration and all this stuff down there but we had uh we we were doing pool sessions and breath holds and all this different work uh throughout the week and one of the wives that was training with us one of the pool sessions was like hey I've been trying to hit my lifeguarding cert certificate or my lifeguarding requirements. And I can't do the underwater swim because I'm, I'm having a hard time remaining underwater for more than like t 10 seconds without completely panicking and rocketing to the surface. And so uh, we went through the mechanics of, of how you uh, dump your air and then take a full breath in and hold your breath. And then we went over what happens in your mind when you go underwater and how that alarm goes off and how you can, work through that and all this other stuff and like literally within 45 minutes the lady went from a 10 second breath hold to a 90 second breath hold underwater you know and it's like um so but these are this is like this is stuff that we're doing we're we've been actively doing this these sessions specifically just like this for five years you know multiple times a week with all different types of groups and demographics so it's all just you know we go into everyone with an open mindset of like you know we're, we're there to coach we're, we're there to coach and, and instruct and add value but we're also there to learn too because this whole thing's kind of an experiment at the same time
It's fascinating stuff. It's so cool in terms of how uh, this can be implemented into uh, a regular training session, especially from a CrossFit perspective. This is something that seems like it fits very much in line with the way the CrossFit has approached training. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Underwater Torpe to Torpedo League now. And before we get you out of here, this, um, this competitive setting that you guys have created. And, you know, uh, Don, you mentioned this is something that maybe started out in the military, uh, underwater football initially, something that maybe you guys use as a training tool and you guys have turned it into a sport. Can you tell us a little bit about the evolution of it and kind of what you guys are looking forward to in terms of next stages with it? Yeah, so uh, I think we started this at, at the very beginning as with just two teams. Uh, one of our mentors, Derek Carrera, he was Prime's uh, team commander in Afghanistan. He was like, hey, if you can get two teams and you can get some people to the pool and watch it, then you have a proof of concept. So we did that in end of 2017 or, or actually beginning of 2018. Then we kind of ran from it from there. Of course, 2020 took a big hit, but now we're up to six teams and we're trying to get it on TV or YouTube TV and, and stream it. Um, the first time we're about to have spectators come to the pool and we're about to put it on the big um, projectors or the big uh, jumbotrons and get it there. But the game is five on five. Um, if you can imagine a water pole in that, you shrink it down, you throw it down at the deep end of the pool. Um, and if uh, it's like a soccer offense, with forwards, mids, and, and defense. And then you have a, a basketball defense, so like a three-man front and two-man in the back. It's similar to what, of course, the, the generalized, but that's how it kind of is right now. But it it's crazy. The, the level of athleticism and the level of talent that has come in and uh, are playing now. We have a lot of ex-Olympic swimmers, uh, ex-Olympic volleyball or volleyball players too, um, water polo players, um, MMA fighters. So it's uh, definitely a, a ring of athletes just battling it out is there anything off limits when because it seems like there's a little bit of grappling going on underwater like what is allowed and what is not allowed yeah there's no kicking no punching uh no ripping goggles off no choking around the neck um no single limb submissions and we had to put that rule in because we were playing with all these mma fighters and an arm bar underwater when they torque it is completely different from when they're trying to do it a little bit on land, you know, because that would really rip your arm out. And it was Alima that did it on Prime, which is pretty funny. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, that's that's off limits. So no pulling strips or anything like that. And How then, do you, uh, yeah, never, not a, we can never obstruct anyone's passage to the surface. Yeah, so unless you, you have the unless anyone. you have the torpedo. Yeah, yeah, you can't grab anyone unless they have the torpedo. How, how do you ref something like this? I mean, you can't exactly blow a whistle and, you know, just, or maybe you can. I don't we know. have, we have underwater buzzers. Okay. Yeah. And signaling. So we, 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 you know, like, like Don said, we, we started and it was like kind of like backyard wrestling and, you know, we didn't have a lot of the rules figured out. And so we've gone through, you know, the last five years of all the times that we had to stop and, you know, had the, an argument break out over a rule or whatever it was that, you know, we then uh, improved our rule set to where now, like everything's just, you know, flowing and the competition is amazing and the game IQ just increases every season. And so um, as we're breaking through the technology, uh, as Don was uh, mentioning, you know, it's just a, a matter of time before we get this, you know, on national TV or, or you know, wherever it's going to end up you know, making the most impact. But uh, some of our videos, like a lot of our stuff was viral online for Underwater Torpedo League, especially. So if you if you just Google Underwater Torpedo League or Deep in Fitness, you'll find a bunch of articles and videos um, out there. But yeah, we love Do it. Do you guys play in one of the teams, on one of the teams? Beast. When we first started, we did, yeah. I don't know if you can see our trophies. That's the very first championship right there and then prime has two i put one in the office so we both have two but ever since then <laughs> we, we just ref and we manage and uh to be honest now if we played with some of the athletes they probably they probably get close yeah i don't know if they would do this but yeah, it, it's amazing. yeah they're yeah, awesome you can see kind of the evolution of a new sport like this and i mean it's kind of like water polo underneath the you know the the fighting that goes on and the the um the intensity it, it's pretty gnarly it, it kind of seems like it, it needs to, to be an athlete that is at a level of comfort in the water that goes beyond what you guys are training in deep, deep end fitness. But what, what would you say would be an allowable or you know, um, kind of a minimum in terms of being able to, to be underneath the water to be able to actually play 
playing a game. It seems like you need to be under there for well, a pretty significant amount of we've, time. We've had individuals that literally couldn't swim at all that started deep in fitness that within two months started playing on it, like started yeah. playing with, started practicing with a team. Oh. And, you know, based off of your skill, based off of your performance is dependent on your, how much gameplay you're going to, you know, actual gameplay that you're going to get. But, um, you know, the, for the actual plays, it's a, it's really like, it, be, it becomes such a, such a chess match because you're managing your oxygen and your energy like individually and collectively with your team to where everybody's, we always have someone underwater at all times on offense and on defense when needed, you know, and ready to flex and support anyone that gets caught up, you know, and, and all that other stuff. So, uh, but an average length of a play 20 seconds, Mm. around 20 seconds now we uh we we had i don't know if you're familiar with uh the international um uh, functional fitness federation uh if3 which is something that was started by former games crossfit athlete gretchen kittleberger she um uh has come out to our power monkey camp before big fan of hers of what she's trying to do in terms of getting a new sport introduced into the olympics and the mm -hmm. challenges that come along with something like that so we've had some conversations with people trying to to do something similar that you guys are doing with uh, the Underwater Torpedo League. And I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, because I do think that you have some aspirations to try to get this into the Olympics at some point. Heard that, you know, as a demo in 2024 is something you guys are striving for. And maybe, you know, obviously you guys being based in Southern California and 2028 being in LA is, uh, you know, probably something you're trying to aim towards. But is this realistically something that you think is, is possibility for the Olympic Games come six years from now? uh i mean we we like don said we took a hit with with in 2020 for for everything shutting down but right now as far as as from our from what we've been told by members of the olympic foundation and, and even olympic committees is that uh if we're on three continents and submit our olympic application that we would have a a good shot at getting in and so right now we have individuals uh you know, from multiple continents hitting us up for UTL. So it's just a matter of, of, you know, continuing the expansion, but just so, just so uh, everyone and really like something specific to the audience here is our main effort right now with our headquarters is similar to how CrossFit expanded with their affiliate program. We're expanding deep in fitness with our licensing program. So we've, uh, we, we train and we certify individuals through our instructor courses, and then we license out deep in fitness to them and they run the program in, in cities that are outside of our. Outside of our immediate reach. So yeah. we have uh, nine, nine locations right now. Uh, we launched Hawaii this week, I'm sorry, this month. And we have uh, some in Southern California, some in Austin. Vermont, Las Vegas, uh, San Antonio. So oh, Vermont, that's not far from where I'm at. I might have to go check one of those out. Um, do. When uh, can you give just like a general idea of what the format might look like if somebody were to sign up and come to one of your courses? Yep, they can jump on our website and uh, just sign up on there. You sign a waiver, just like a, you would sign a CrossFit waiver, uh, go into a new gym or a new box. Um, and then, then from there, they would just show up to the session. And that's it. So it's pretty simple. They would run the screener. If they don't pass the screener, we'll help them pass the screener and then we'll go from there. So my, I guess my question is more like what if let's make you, you make it past the screener, you're there, you're, I'm not, I don't, not really sure how long the course is, but what can somebody anticipate to like the beginning of it's going to be breath work and then you're going to go into this. And then, so what's that kind of look like? Yeah. So we always start off what we call the circle of trust, where we establish uh, their personal goals and they, it's an opportunity for the instructors to understand the level and the backgrounds of um, people's athletic and aquatic abilities. And then we'll do some breath work. We'll do some calisthenics um, to warm up. We'll do some stretching and then we'll do some skills building, um, skills builder or breath work uh, in the water to increase breath holds. They might do some breath holds. It might do some underwater swims, work on form. And then we'll go into a, a wad or a workout kind of style. Do people, do you guys have anybody play uh, um, underwater torpedo league at the end of the course at all? Or is that, 
Yeah. So at each at end of each practice, most of the instructors will set time a uh, a lot at a side to to play the underwater torpedo league. So that's always a like a a reward for after doing the workout to play. Do you ever have anybody opt out of that? Like I don't, I'm not ready for that. We definitely have. Yeah, yeah. So people that are just there for the screener and just trying to pass. They might stay in the pool and they might watch and see what's going on. Uh, but we definitely have. But uh, the competitive people and the other people are like, hey, I want to try something new. Let's let's check it out. So it's a no, super I'm, fun environment. No, I'm, you know, very interested in the Olympic world, and it's something I've kind of devoted my life to as an athlete, and just stayed very interested in the sports that are involved with the Olympics. And you can see kind of an evolution that's happening within the IOC with the number of sport or the types of sports that they're involving. It's no longer this like core group of sports that have, are always there. They're looking to do quite an evolution in terms of what's uh, being incorporated, whether that be surfing or now we have karate and now we have um, break dancing becoming a sport in, in the next Olympic games and kind of a lot more of these three on three basketball, a lot of these things that are kind of trying to uh, take advantage of the next generation and, and the mindset that the next generation might have in terms of interest level and attention span and those kind of things. This, this, this is something that um, is new. It's interesting. Um, curious for a couple of questions here. One, everything happens underneath the water. So I'm curious from your perspective, how do you engage with someone that might want to come and watch it as opposed to watching this type of thing at home? Are there benefits to being in person and watching this if everything is happening below surface? How do you get people to be engaged if they're not actually able to see the action in person? Yeah, so we're working on that right now. And number one is the tech piece, like, hey, how do we bring the viewers underwater, right? So that's, hey, maybe put it on a big screen. They might hear the yelling and the screaming of the team that's playing, um, that that um, celebrating once they score. Um, but the ultimate goal is to get some type of glass you know, pool that people can watch and spectate from light up the pool, light up the water. And there's, you know, like back in Coronado where they have the Navy SEAL trainings at, they have a, a dive tank that has glass walls and there's a few of them across the United States, but the ultimate goal is to build our own arena that can do that. Right. And they, they use them as well in Las Vegas for like the circus Olays and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So the technology and everything's out there. We just need to get a hold of it um, and then move forward with it. Fascinating. That's a, it's a huge biome, but that would be such an interesting way to be, you know, it's kind of like an aquarium uh, type of setup where you get to see an insight into what's happening underneath the water. Yeah. Uh, it seems to happen quite a bit in synchronized swimming too, right? Where we're watching, we only see what's happening above the water, but a lot of uh, the interesting pieces are actually below the water too, right? Kind of a duck before below the water. So all the action is happening. Yeah. Um, one more question. Um, you mentioned that, you know, as a necessity of having a lot of uh, three continents participate, participating to be able to present this to the IOC as a viable option in the Olympic Games. I'm curious if you have any strategies around trying to expand, aside from just someone reaching out to you saying, hey, we want to play this sport in X country, X city outside of the States. Do you guys have any expansion ideas outside of the US that are coming from uh, the internal side of things? So we have the legal uh, mechanism ready for that through intellectual property and trademarks. And in really key areas that we're looking at right now and, and from our internal team is like, hey, where are other places across the world that is extremely uh, active and looking at to kind of create something new and start something new? Um, and an easy target would be Australia. I would say like, Australia is like, they're all swimmers, right? Yeah, and when we were, um, when, when I was in the military still, I worked a lot with uh, some of those military guys over there. So they actually came out to Las Vegas to our instructor course out here and, and attended. So we have a lot of interest over there and we trained one instructor and he's over there right now, kind of starting and seeing what that's like um, and training in those. I don't know if you've ever been to Australia and sitting at like those Bondi pools where they fill up with yeah. ocean water. So he's been running like some small sessions over there. So that's definitely the next target. Um, and besides that, down in South America, Brazil has, a, we have a huge following in Brazil um, down there. So those might be the two key target areas that we're targeting next. Super interesting. And do other militaries use this technique as part of their training too, since this comes directly from military? Or is, was this something originated in the U.S. and kind of um, has stayed within the U.S. military? And, or does anyone else kind of use similar techniques? Um, from the few countries I've been to, there's always aquatics training. They have dive school for whatever, you know, uh, unit that they're associated with. Uh, but the way that we train with incorporating breath work and movement and all that stuff, I have not seen it yet. 
Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And, and then uh, underwater rugby and underwater hockey have been around since 1940s and 1950s. And so the, but the major difference between what we do is we don't use fins and we use it's 360 degree full contact combat sports. So when with fins and with uh, with the hockey sticks and everything, it's like face down on the bottom of the pool. Mm -hmm. And then with us, it kind of makes it more dynamic because you got you can use the entire pool and there's, you know, engagements throughout the, the whole game. That's actually a good question. Um, how big is the uh, pitch or field? I mean, at the typical pool, like do you like how big is 25 meters? 25 so it's a 25 meter pool that's the whole thing you're playing within 25 meters uh in length and then width is typically um 20 meters or wow. four lanes pretty much and then uh 12 to 15 feet deep that's big and how many people on a team five on five seems like a lot of ground to cover <laughs> yeah depends if you're a great swimmer be yeah, I'm not a great swimmer so <laughs> oh yeah and then for that for the game like there's all different body types that can be involved because you know, you can have your your bigger, bigger muscular swimmer uh, in the back on defense, you know, and then you can have your fast, fast forwards up in the front on offense on either side. And then you can have the ones in the middle kind of it as midfielders, you know, and kind of play with it like that. So it's interesting and with the how strategy. Far, of it. How far will one of these torpedoes go if you throw it well? Halfway across the pool. So if you got a sniper you can just like launch them into the net from uh, like from quite a distance yeah. yeah for sure which is cool we got to check this out jordan we got, yeah, we got to make a trip down to southern california and uh check out one of the trainings maybe come to one of the courses and uh hang i definitely that. need it i i did a a competition a couple of years ago and it had a 600 meter swim in it and then a mile and a half run and i remember thinking i'm not a fast swimmer but i'm a strong swimmer i'll be fine and I'd never done like a group start like that into the water. And it, I thought I was going to die. Like within the first 60 meters, I'm like, this is it. This is how it ends. And uh, the only thing that kept me going was that the, the heats that started before me were like, you know, the less experienced heats and they were all running. They were all in the run. I'm like, well, if these freaking people can do it, like I can make it through. I'm just going to be slow. And uh, so I need all of the help that you guys have. So. Yeah, we got you covered. Yeah, I just spent a lot of triathletes just for that reason, the starting point of mm -hmm. their swim, you know, because a lot of arms, a lot of legs. Oh, yeah. Get the same space that you're trying yeah. to use. So. Well, before yeah. I get you guys out of here, uh, would you guys mind answering some uh, quick quick questions? Of course. We all of our sure. uh, podcast guests. Of course. First one is um, we don't have our normal weightlifting coach here, but I'm not quite sure if you have any experience on either the gymnastics or weightlifting side, but do you have a what sport or discipline do you prefer weightlifting or gymnastics if you have to choose between the two weightlifting wow both of you guys and stereo yeah that was, that was uh it's probably because i i suck at gymnastics like i'm <laughs> i'm i probably have done like three <laughs> ring muscle ups my entire life so bar muscle ups no problem but so, so uh, we'll come up. we'll come to your course you we'll get you guys to come out to our power monkey camp and we'll get you all skilled up on gymnastics and, weightlifting and everything in between i love that Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Next question. Any guest uh, that you think would be a good person for us to have on the podcast, somebody you maybe come across recently or a mentor of some kind that might be a good person for us to interview? Yeah, I mean, I got a, I got a bunch. I'll, uh, I'll put some thought to it and then, well, I guess I need to give it now. Huh? You don't have to. You can, you can put it into the notes. We'll make sure we get into the notes. But if you do have someone uh, off the top of your head, great. If not, we can put it in the notes. And um, maybe the final question would be, uh, if you guys are, are, are avid readers or not, um, do you have a book that, that you would recommend to, to our listeners as far as something that you got a lot of value from? Um, or like deep and fitness specific or anything in life? A anything really, yeah. Um, I've just recently read Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I love that book. I felt like I was him for a second. Yeah, so that was a good one. Yeah, I, I think you're you're speaking Portland, Dave's so. language here. Yeah, I live I live in Portland, so uh, Nike is surrounding me. I actually live very close to Beaverton, so I'm all about that Nike life. Yeah, when we were up there, business partners, 
yeah, it was up there and we were just on the campus and trying to get into the campus with our program and their pool and their facility. Oh, cool. Next time we're up there, we'd love to hang yeah, out. Yeah, hit me up. Hit me up for sure. Yeah. Well, guys, um, where can we find I, you? Where can our listeners find Oh, you got a book? Yeah, I got a book. So yeah, two book. two books. One is The Power of Intention by Wayne Dyer. Yep. And then the other one is The Gap in the Game. Hmm. And I, I got to look at the who the author is on that, but The Gap in the Game is a newer one. Those are the two that I recommend. Excellent. Let me make sure we add those to our list of uh, extensive reading that we need to catch up on, Jordan. Yeah. So where you can find us is uh, Prime Hall on LinkedIn, uh, Prime Time on Instagram, Prime at UTL Nation email, and then my phone number is 956-224-0055. I like to throw that out there and see how many, see what how many texts you get. Yeah. That's yeah. not my, that's not my drone blown. drop, dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Don, you don't have Instagram anymore, so you got to give your number out as well. I made, uh, <laughs> I made another. I made another one. It's called uh, Don Dot Lives. So let people know I'm still alive. <laughs> no, no, no post, just the title. Don Lives. No post. Well, thank you guys for taking the time. Really appreciate it. It's great chatting with you guys and learning a little bit more of what you guys are doing. Uh, like Jordan and I said, we'd love to uh, come down to LA and and hang out with you guys and get a little bit more proficient in the water. Uh, for all those listeners out there, out there, please be sure to head over to PowerMonkeyFitness.com for services and upcoming events. We have our next Power Monkey Camp coming up September 25th, October 1st. Sales are at PowerMonkeyCamp.com. Please check out our Instagram pages for regular teaching and technical content at Power, Power Monkey Fitness, at Dave Durante, and at Jordan Samuel Photo. Is that correct, Jordan? I want to make sure I get that one correct. You got and it. Power Monkey Fitness, right? I'm right. Yeah, you got, got it. it. I got it. At Power Monkey Fitness, we're your hosts. I'm Dave Durante with my co-host Jordan Samuel. And until next time, thank you all for listening.